Chapter 5 Vaidhi Bhakti is Eternal Lahiri Mahashai had a residence in Shantipur. His two sons were both highly educated. The elder, Chandranath, who was thirty-five years old, was a zamandar and managed all the household affairs. He was also a scholar in medical science. Chandranath never underwent any hardship for the sake of spiritual progress, but he commanded tremendous respect in the Brahmana community. He employed servants, maids, doorkeepers and other workers, and he managed all the household affairs with comfort and prestige. From childhood, the younger son Devidas had studied the Shastras dealing with logic, Nyaya Shastra, and that presents the codes of religious ritual, Smriti Shastra. Across the road from the family residence, he opened a school dedicated to the study of the four Vedas and the four subjects, grammar, rhetoric, logic and philosophy. There he taught a group of ten to fifteen students and had the title Vidyaratna, Jewel of Learning. One day, a rumor circulated in Shantipur that Kalidas Lahari Mahashai had put on a dress of an ascetic and had become a Vaishnava. The news spread everywhere, at the bathing ghats, in the marketplace and on the streets. Someone said, The old man has become senile. He was a man of ideal character for so long, but now he has gone mad. Someone else said, What kind of disease is this? All kinds of happiness is there in his home. He is a Brahmana by birth, and his sons and family members are all obedient to him. What suffering could drive such a man to adopt the life of a mendicant? Another person said, This is the ill fate of those who wander here and there, shouting, This is Dharma, this is Dharma. A virtuous man said, Kalidas Lahari Mahashai is a very pious soul. He is materially prosperous, and now in his maturity he has developed love for Harinam. As different people gossiped and spread various rumors, someone went to Devidas Vidyaratna and reported what he had heard. Vidyaratna became quite anxious and went to his elder brother. Brother, he said, it looks as if we have to face great difficulty because of father. He is staying in Godruma in Nadia on the plea of maintaining good health, but he has fallen into bad company there. It is impossible to ignore the outcry in the village about this. Chandranath said, Brother, I have also heard some rumors. Our family is highly respected, but now we can no longer show our faces because of our father's activities. We have always belittled the descendants of Advaita Prabhu, but now what has become of our own house? Come, let's go inside. We shall discuss this matter with mother and decide what should be done. Soon afterwards, Chandranath and Devidas were seated on the second-floor veranda, taking their meal, which was served by a Brahmini widow. Their mother sat with them. Chandranath said, Mother, have you heard any news of father? Mother said, Why, he's well, isn't he? He is staying in Sri Navadweep, and he has become mad after Harinam. Why don't you bring him here? Devidas said, Mother, father is quite well. But according to the reports we have been hearing, we can no longer rely on him. On the contrary, if we brought him here, we would become a social disgrace. Mother became somewhat perturbed and asked, What has happened to him? Just recently I went to the bank of the Ganga and had a long talk with the wife of one of the leading Goswamis. She told me, Your husband has met with great auspiciousness. He has earned tremendous respect among the Vaishnavas. Devidas raised his voice slightly and said, He has certainly gained respect, but at the cost of our heads. Would he have remained at home in his old age and accepted our service? No, but see now, he's bent on defaming our prestigious family by subsisting on the remnants of ragged mendicants of different castes. Alas, this is the tragic effect of the age of Kali. He was such an experienced man, but what has become of his intelligence? Mother said, Bring him here now, and keep him hidden until you can persuade him to change his mind. Chandranath said, What other alternative do we have? Devi, go to Godruma secretly with two or three men and bring father here. Devidas said, You both know very well that father has no regard for me because he considers me to be an atheist. 
I am afraid that he may not even speak to me if I go there. Devidas had a maternal cousin called Shambhunath, who was very dear to Lahiri Mahashai. He had stayed with him for a long time and had rendered much service to him. It was decided that Devidas and Shambhunath would go together to Godruma, so a servant was sent that very day to a brahmana's house in Godruma to arrange for their residential quarters. The next day, when Devidas and Shambhunath had finished their meal, they set out for Godruma. Having reached their appointed lodging, they got down from their palanquins and gave the bearers permission to depart. A brahmana cook and two servants had arrived there in advance. At dusk, Devidas and Shambhunath made their way towards Sri Pradyumna Kunja. On their arrival, they saw Lahiri Mahashai sitting on a mat of leaves on Suribi Terrace with his eyes closed. He was chanting Hari Nam on his Tulsi Mala, and his body was decorated in twelve places with tilak. Devidas and Shambhunath slowly climbed up onto the terrace and offered pranam at his feet. On hearing footsteps, Lahiri Mahashai opened his eyes and was astonished to see the two men. Shambhu, he exclaimed, what brings you here? How are you? By your blessings we are quite well, they replied politely. Will you take your meal here? asked Lahiri Mahashai. We have already arranged for a place to stay, they replied. You need not worry about us. At that moment, loud chanting of Sri Hari's name was heard from Prem Das Babaji's Madhavi Malati Bawa. Vaishnav Das Babaji came out of his kutia and asked Lahiri Mahashai, Why was there such a loud sound of Hari Nam from Paramahamsa Babaji's grove? Lahiri Mahashai and Vaishnav Das Babaji went ahead to investigate and found many Vaishnavas circumambulating Babaji Mahashai and chanting Sri Hari's name. The two of them also joined in the assembly. Everyone offered Dandavat Pranam to Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj and sat down on the terrace. Devidas and Shambhunath were also seated on one side of the terrace like crows in an assembly of swans. In the meantime, one of the Vaishnavas said, We have come from Kantaka Nagara, Katwa. Our main purpose is to take darshan of Sri Navadweep Mayapur and to obtain the dust of the lotus feet of Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj. Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj felt embarrassed and said, I am a great sinner. You have simply come to purify me. After a short time, it was discovered that these Vaishnavas were all expert at singing bhajans glorifying Sri Hari. Mridanga and cartels were brought at once, and a senior member of the assembly began to sing a bhajan from Pratana. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Gadai Advaita Chandra Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Apara Karuna Sindhu Vaishnava Thakur Mohena Pamaradaya Karaha Prachur Jati Vidya Dana Jana Made Mata Jane Udara Karahe Nata Kripa Vitarane Kanaka Kamini Loba Pratishta Vashana Chadaiya Shoda More E Mora Pratana Name Ruche Jiva Doya Vaishnava Ulas Daya Kare Deha More Ohe Krishna Das Tomara Charana Chaya Eka Matra Ash Jivane Marane Matra Amara Baras O Shri Krishna Chaitanya Chandra, O Prabhu Nityananda, O Gadadha, O Advaita Chandra, O Gora's Bhaktas, O Vaishnava Thako, you are a boundless ocean of mercy. Please bestow your profuse mercy on a sinful creature like me. O Master, please be merciful and deliver this person intoxicated with the pride of high birth, education, wealth and attachment to wife, children and family members. Please purify me of my lust for women and wealth and the desire for prestige. This is my prayer. O servant of Sri Krishna, please be merciful and give me a taste for Sri Nam and compassion for all jivas and let me delight in the association of Vaishnavas. The shade of your lotus feet is my only hope 
my sole refuge in life and in death. When this bhajan came to an end, the Vaishnavas sang a prayer composed by Kalidas Lahari Mahashai, which was charming and full of poetic sentiment. Miche maya vashe samsara sagare padiya chilama ami karuna kariya diya pada chaya amare tarila tumi tomara charane sambiachi mata moraduka kora dura Jatira Gorava Kevala Rorava Vidya Seya Vidya Kala Shodhya E Maya Nitaye Charane Sampahe Jauka Java Tomara Kripaya Amara Jivaya Spuraka Yugala Nama Kahe Kalidasa Amara Hridaye Jaguka Shri Radha Shama I fell into the ocean of samsara and became enslaved in futile activities by the influence of Maya. You were merciful and delivered me by giving me the shade of your lotus feet. O Vaishnava Thakur, Please hear me. I have surrendered my head at your feet. Please dispel my misery. Pride of caste is a terrible hell. Material learning is but an aspect of ignorance. Please purify me and deliver me to the feet of Nittai. Please extinguish my blazing agony. By your mercy, may the holy names of Sri Yugala appear on my tongue, and may Sri Radha Sham appear in my heart. This is the prayer of Kalidas. Singing this bhajan together, all of them became maddened with joy. At the end they repeated the line, Jaguka Shri Radha Sham. May Shri Radha Sham appear in my heart, and began to dance exuberantly. As they continued to dance, a few Bavuk Vaishnavas fell unconscious. An extraordinary atmosphere developed, and as Devidas witnessed all this, he began to think that his father was deeply immersed in the pursuit of spiritual truth and that it would be difficult to take him home. It was about midnight when the meeting broke up. Everyone exchanged Dandavat Pranam and returned to their respective places. Devidas and Shambhunath took permission from their father and returned to their lodgings. The following day, when they had finished their meal, Devi and Shambhu went to the Kutir of Lahiri Mahashai. Devidas Vidyaratna offered Pranam to Lahiri Mahashai and said, Dear Father, I have one request to make to you. Please come and reside in our house at Shantipur. We will all be very happy to serve you at home. We can also arrange for a solitary kutia for you, if you give your permission. Lahiri Mahashai replied, It is a good idea, but I would not get the type of sadhu sangha in Shantipur that I get here. Devi, you know the people of Shantipur. They are so godless and so fond of slandering others that a man can hardly be satisfied to live there. Granted, there are many brahmanas there, but their intelligence has become crooked by their association with shallow-minded materialists like the weavers. The people of Shantipur have three outstanding qualities, fine garments, grandiose words, and blasphemy of Vaishnavas. The descendants of Advaita Prabhu are suffering so much trouble there that they too have become almost inimical to Mahaprabhu because of negative association. You should therefore grant that I may stay here in Godruma. That is my desire. Devidas said, Dear Father, what you say is true. But why must you have anything to do with the people of Shantipur? Stay in a solitary place and spend your days cultivating your religious practices such as Sandhya Vandana. A Brahmana's daily work is also his eternal religion. Nitya Dharma, and it is the duty of a great soul like yourself to be absorbed in that way. Becoming somewhat grave, Lahiri Mahashai said, My dear son, those days are no more. Now that I have lived for a few months in the association of sadhus 
and have heard Sri Guru Dev's instructions, my understanding has changed dramatically. I understand now that what you refer to as Nitya Dharma is really temporary Dharma, Naimitika Dharma. The only Nitya Dharma is Hari Bhakti. Sandhya Vandana and other such practices are in reality Naimitika Dharma. Devidas said, Father, I have never seen or heard of such an explanation in any Shastra. Is Sandhya Vandana not Hari Bhajan? If it is Hari Bhajan, then it is also Nitya Dharma. Is there any difference between Sandhya Vandana and the practices that constitute Vaidhi Bhakti, such as Shravan and Kirtanam? Lahiri Mahashai said, The Sandhya Vandana that is included in Karma Kanda is significantly different from Vaidhi Bhakti. Sandhya Vandana and other such activities are performed in the Karma Kanda system in order to obtain liberation. However, activities of Hari Bhajan, such as Shravan and Kirtan, have no ulterior motive. The Shastras describe the results of hearing, chanting and other limbs of Vaidhi Bhakti, but this is just to interest people who would otherwise not be inclined to perform those activities. The worship of Sri Hari has no fruit other than the service of Sri Hari. The principal fruit of the practice of Vaidhi Bhakti is to bring about the awakening of Prem in Hari Bhajan. Devidas Then you do admit that the divisions, Angas, of Hari Bhajan have some secondary results. Lahiri Yes, but the results depend on the different types of practitioner, Sadak. The Vaishnavas perform sadhan bhakti for the sole purpose of coming to the perfectional stage of devotion known as siddha bhakti. When non-Vaishnavas perform the very same divisions, angas of bhakti, they have two principal motives, the desire for material enjoyment, bhoga, and the desire for liberation, moksha. Externally, there is no apparent difference between the sadhan practices of the Vaishnavas and those of non-Vaishnavas, but there is a fundamental difference in motivation. When one worships Krishna through the path of karma, the mind is purified, and one may obtain material fruits, freedom from disease or liberation. But the same worship of Krishna through the path of bhakti produces only prem for Krishna Nam. When karmis, those who follow the path of karma, observe a codice, it eradicates their sins, whereas when bhaktas observe a codice, it enhances their hari bhakti. Just see what a world of difference there is. The difference between sadhan performed as an aspect of karma and sadhan performed as an aspect of bhakti is clear, but it is very subtle and only one who has Bhagavan's mercy may know it. The bhaktas obtain the primary result, whereas the karmis are caught up in the secondary results which may be broadly divided into two categories, namely bhukti, material sense enjoyment, and mukti, liberation. Devidas, then why do the shastras extol the virtues of the secondary results? Lahiri, there are two kinds of people in this world, those who are spiritually awake and those who are spiritually unconscious. The shastras have praised secondary results for the benefit of those who are spiritually unconscious and who do not perform any pious activity unless they can visualize a forthcoming result. However, the Shastras do not intend such people to remain satisfied with secondary results. Rather, their attraction to secondary results should induce them to perform virtuous acts which will hasten their contact with sadhus. Then, by the mercy of the sadhus, they will come to know of the primary results of Hari Bhajan and taste for those results will awaken within them. Devidas Then are we to understand that Raghunandan and the other authors of the Shmiti Shastras are spiritually unconscious? Lahiri No, but the system that they have prescribed is for the spiritually unconscious. However, they themselves seek the primary result. Devidas some Shastras only describe the secondary results and do not mention the primary results at all. Why is this? Lahiri There are three types of Shastra, 
corresponding to the varieties of Adhika among human beings, Sattvic, of the nature of goodness, Rajasic, of the nature of passion, and Tamasic, of the nature of ignorance. The Sattvic Shastras are for people who are imbued with the nature of goodness, Sattva Gun. The Rajasic Shastras are for those enveloped by the nature of passion, Rajagun, and the Tamasic Shastras are for those engrossed in the nature of ignorance, Tamagun. Devidas. If that is the case, how should one know which directives of the Shastra to have faith in? And how may those who are less eligible attain a higher destination? Lahiri. Human beings have different natures and faiths according to their different levels of Adhika. People who are impelled primarily by the mode of ignorance have natural faith in the Tamasic Shastras. Those affected primarily by the mode of passion have natural faith in the Rajasic Shastras, and those in the mode of goodness naturally have faith in the Sattvic Shastras. One's belief in a particular conclusion of the Shastra is naturally in accordance with one's faith. As one faithfully carries out the duties for which one has the Adhika, he may come into contact with sadhus and develop a higher Adhika through their association. As soon as a higher Adhika is awakened, one's nature is elevated and one will naturally develop faith in a more elevated Shastra. The authors of the Shastras were infallible in their wisdom and composed the Shastras in such a way that one will gradually develop higher Adhika by carrying out the duties for which one is eligible and in which one naturally has faith. It is for this reason that different directives have been given in different Shastras. Faith in the Shastra is the root of all auspiciousness. Srimad Bhagavad Gita is the Mimamsa Shastra of all the Shastras. This Siddhanta is clearly stated there. Devidas, I have studied many Shastras since my childhood, but today, by your grace, I have realized a wonderful truth. Lahiri, it is written in the Srimad Bhagavatam 11, 8, 10. Anubhyascha mahadbhyascha, Shastre bhya kushalo nara, Saravata saram adadyat, Pushpe bhya eva satpada. An intelligent person will take the essence of all the Shastras, whether they are great or small, just as a bumblebee gathers honey from many different types of flowers. My dear son, I used to call you an atheist. Now I don't criticize anyone, because faith depends on Adhika. There is no question of criticism in this regard. Everyone is working according to their own Adhika, and they will advance gradually when the time is appropriate. You are a scholar of the Shastras dealing with logic and fruitive action, and since your statements are in accordance with your Adhika, there is no fault in them. Devidas, until now, I believed that there were no scholars in the Vaishnava Sampradaya. I thought that the Vaishnavas were merely fanatics who concerned themselves solely with one part of the Shastra. But what you have explained today has completely dispelled my misconceptions. Now I have faith that some of the Vaishnavas have truly understood the essence of the Shastra. Are you studying the Shastras from any great soul these days? Lahiri My son, you may now call me a fanatical Vaishnava or whatever you like. My Gurudev performs bhajan in the kutia next to mine. He has instructed me in the essential conclusion of all the Shastras, and I have just expressed the same thing to you. If you would like to receive instruction at his lotus feet, you may inquire from him in a devotional mood. Come, I will introduce you to him. Lahiri Mahashai took Devidas Vidyaratna to the kutia of Sri Vaishnavdas Babaji and introduced him to his Gurudev. He then left Devidas with Babaji Maharaj and returned to his kutia to chant Harinam. Vaishnavadas My dear son, what is the extent of your education? Devidas, I have studied up to Muktipad and the Siddhanta Kusumanjali in the Naya Shastra and all the books of the Shmiti Shastra. Vaishnavadas, then you have labored diligently in your study of the Shastra. Please give me a sample of what you have learned. Devidas, 
atyanta dukam nibriti eva muktihi. The cessation of all material miseries is known as mukti. One should always endeavor to obtain mukti, which is defined in this statement from Shankya Darshan, 1, 1 and 6, 5. I am seeking that liberation through faithful adherence to my prescribed duties, known as Swadharma. Vaishnavadas Yes, like yourself, after I had studied all those books, I also used to aspire for mukti. Devidas Have you now given up the pursuit of mukti? Vaishnavadas My dear son, tell me, what is the meaning of mukti? Devidas According to the Nyaya Shastra, the Jiva and Brahman are eternally distinct from each other. So it is not clear from the point of view of Naya how the cessation of all miseries can take place. According to the Vedanta, however, Mukti refers to the attainment of non-differentiated Brahman, or in other words, the Jiva's attainment of the state of oneness with Brahman. This is clear from one point of view. Vaishnavadas my dear son, I have studied Shankara's Vedanta commentary for fifteen years, and I also remained a sannyasi for several years. I endeavored strenuously to attain mukti. I spent a long time deeply meditating upon what Shankara considered to be the four principal statements of the Shruti, Mahavakyas. Finally, I understood that the religious system that Shankara advocated was newly fashioned, so I gave it up. Davidas why did you consider it to be a recent and antagonistic view? Vaishnavdas An experienced man cannot easily convey to others what he has realized through practical examination. How will those who have not experienced it be able to understand it? Davidas could see that Vaishnavdas was a learned scholar and that he was straightforward and deeply realized. Davidas had not studied Vedanta and he began to think that he could do so if Vaishnavdas were merciful to him. So he inquired, Am I fit to study Vedanta? Vaishnavdas, With the level of competence that you have achieved in the Sanskrit language, you can easily learn Vedanta if you get a qualified instructor. Devidas, If you will kindly teach me, I will study under you. Vaishnavdas, The fact is that I am a servant of the Vaishnavas. There is nothing for me besides this. Paramahamsa Babaji Maharaj has mercifully instructed me to chant Harinam constantly, and I am doing just that. I have so little time. Besides, Jagat Guru Sri Rupa Goswami has specifically forbidden the Vaishnavas to read or hear Shankara Sarikya Basya commentary on Vedanta. So I no longer read it myself or teach it to others. However, Sri Sachinandan, who is the original preceptor of the entire world, explained the true commentary on Vedanta Sutra to Sri Sava Bhoma. Many Vaishnavas still have handwritten copies of that commentary. If you want to study it, you can make a copy and I can help you understand it. You may ask for a copy from the house of Srimad Kavi Kanapur in the village of Kanchanapali. Devidas, I will try. You are a great scholar of Vedanta. Please tell me frankly, Will I be able to ascertain the true meaning of Vedanta by studying the Vaishnava commentary? Vaishnavdas I have studied and taught the commentary of Shankara and I have also studied Sri Ramanuja's Sri Basya and other commentaries as well. However, I have not seen any explanation of the sutras that is superior to Mahaprabhu's. This commentary was recorded by Gopinathacharya and it is studied by the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. There can be no doctrinal dispute in Bhagavan's own explanation of the sutras, for his commentary accurately represents the full import of the Upanishads. If one presents this explanation of the sutras in proper sequence, it is certain that his explanation will be respected in any assembly of learned scholars. Devidas Vidyaratna became very pleased to hear this. He faithfully offered Dandavat Pranam to Sri Vaishnavdas Babaji and returned to his father's kutia where he related to his father what he had heard. Lahiri Mahashai was delighted and replied, Devi, you have acquired a great deal of education, but now you can try to attain the highest destination, which is the ultimate benefit for all living beings. 
Davidas. Actually, my sole purpose in coming was to take you home. Please return to our house just once, and everyone will become satisfied. Mother is particularly anxious to have darshan of your feet once more. Lahiri. I have taken shelter of the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas, and I have pledged that I will never enter any house that is opposed to bhakti. First you will have to become Vaishnavas, and then you can take me home. Davidas. Father, how can you say that? We worship the Lord every day at home. We don't disrespect the chanting of Harinam. We receive guests and Vaishnavas cordially. Aren't we to be regarded as Vaishnavas? Lahiri. Your activities are very similar to those of the Vaishnavas, but you are not actually Vaishnavas. Davidas. Then how can one become a Vaishnava? Lahiri. You can become a Vaishnava by giving up your temporary Naimitika duties and adopting your eternal spiritual Nitya Dharma. Devidas, I have one doubt that I would ask you to resolve decisively. The activities of the Vaishnavas consist of Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyam and Atmani Vedanam and they are significantly connected with matter. So why aren't they also referred to as temporary, Naimitika? I perceive some partiality in this. Activities such as the service of the deity, fasting and worship with material ingredients are all connected with gross matter. So how can they be eternal? Lahiri My son, I also needed a long time to understand this point. Try to understand this very carefully. There are two types of human beings, those whose interests are connected with this material world and those who aspire for superior attainments in the future. Those in the first category only strive for material happiness, reputation and material prosperity. Those in the second category are of three types. Those who are devoted to Ishwara, Ishanugata, those who are fixed in the pursuit of monistic knowledge aiming at liberation, Gyan Nishta, and those who covet mystic powers, Siddhi Kami. The Siddhi Kamis are attached to the fruits of Karma Kanda, and they desire to obtain supernatural powers by their performance of karma. The methods which they adopt to obtain such unearthly powers are Yaga, offering oblations, Yagna, performing sacrifice, and Astanga Yoga, the Eightfold Yoga System. They accept the existence of Ishwara, but they believe that he is subordinate to the laws of karma. This category includes the material scientists. The Gyanishtas try to awaken their identity with Brahman by cultivating impersonal monistic knowledge. They don't know or care whether Ishwara exists or not but they fabricate an imaginary form of Ishwara anyway for the purpose of practicing sadhan. The fruit of monistic knowledge is realizing one's identity with Brahman, and the monists aspire to attain this eventually by constantly engaging in the practices of bhakti directed towards their imaginary form of Ishwara. When they obtain the result of jnana, they have no more use for the Ishwara that they have merely imagined as a means to achieve their end. When their bhakti towards Ishwara bears its desired fruit, it is converted into jnana. According to this doctrine, neither Bhagavan nor bhakti to Bhagavan is eternal. The third category of those who seek higher attainments in the future, paramatikas, are those who are devoted to Ishwara, Ishanugatas. Factually speaking, they are the only ones who strive for paramata, the highest goal of life. In their opinion, there is only one Ishwara who is infinite and endless and who manifests the jivas in the material world by his own potencies. The jivas are his eternal servants and remain so even after liberation. The eternal dharma of the jiva is to remain eternally under the guidance of Ishwara, for he can do nothing by his own strength. The jiva cannot obtain any everlasting benefit by the performance of karma. However, when he submits himself to Sri Krishna's shelter, he obtains all perfection by his grace. Those who covet mystic powers, Siddhi Karmis, follow Karma Kanda, and those who cultivate monistic knowledge, Gyan Nishtas, follow Gyan Kanda. 
The Ishanugatas are the only devotees of Ishwara. The Gyan Kandis and Karma Kandis pride themselves on being interested in higher attainment, Paramatika. But in reality, they are not pursuing the highest goal, but seeking temporary material gain. And whatever they say about Dharma is Naimitika, circumstantial or temporary. The present-day worshippers of Shiva, Durga, Ganesh and Surya are known respectively as Shaivas, Shaktas, Ganapatyas and Suryas, and they all follow Gyan Kanda. They adopt the limbs of Bhakti, such as Shravana and Kirtana, only to attain Mukti, and ultimately the undifferentiated, impersonal Nirvishesh Brahman. Those who engage in Shravana and Kirtanam without any desire for Bhakti or Mukti are engaged in the service of Sri Vishnu. Among these five deities, the form of Bhagavan Sri Vishnu is eternal, transcendental and full of all potencies. Those who do not accept Bhagavan as the object of worship are merely worshipping temporary objects. My son, the service that all of you render at home to the deity of Bhagavan is not paramatic, because you do not accept the eternality of Bhagavan's form. That is why you cannot be counted among the Ishanugatas. Now I hope that you have understood the difference between Nitya and Naimitika Upasana, worship. Devidas, yes, if one worships the deity of Bhagavan, but does not accept that deity as eternal, then it is not worship of an eternal object. However, can't one adopt a temporary means of worship to attain the eternal truth, which is ultimately distinct from any such temporary forms. Lahiri Even if that were the case, such temporary worship cannot be called eternal dharma. Nitya dharma is the worship of the eternal deity as performed in Vaishnava dharma. Devidas But the deity that is worshipped is fashioned by a human being, so how can it be eternal? Lahiri the deity worshipped by the Vaishnavas is not like that. Bhagavan is not formless like Brahman. On the contrary, he is the all-powerful, concentrated embodiment of eternity, knowledge and bliss. It is that sat chit ananda gana vigraha that is the worshipable deity of the Vaishnavas. Bhagavan's transcendental form of eternity, bliss and knowledge is first revealed in the pure consciousness of the jiva, and then it is reflected in the mind. The external form of the deity is fashioned according to this transcendental form revealed in the mind, and by the power of bhakti-yoga, the satchit ananda form of Bhagavan then manifests in the deity. When the devotee takes darshan of the deity, that deity unites with the transcendental form of Bhagavan that the devotee sees in his heart. The deity that the jnanis worship, however, is not like that. They think that the deity is a statue made of material elements, but that the state of Brahman is present in it while they are conducting their worship, and that it becomes a mere material statue again after they have finished their worship. Now you should consider the difference between these two conceptions of the deity and their respective methods of worship. When one obtains Vaishnava Diksha by the mercy of a genuine guru, he will be able to observe the results of both and understand this difference correctly. Devidas. Yes, now this all makes more sense to me. Now I see that the Vaishnavas are not just fanatics driven by blind faith. Rather, they are endowed with subtle and discriminating insight. There is a major difference between the worship of the deity and the temporary worship of an imaginary form of the Lord that has been imposed on a material object. There is no difference in the external procedures of worship, but there is a vast difference in the faith of the two worshippers. I will think about this for some days. Father, today my greatest doubt has been dispelled. Now I can say emphatically that the Gyanis' worship is merely an attempt to cheat Sri Bhagavan. I will submit this topic at your feet again at a later time. After saying this, Devi Vidyaratna and Shambhu departed for their residential quarters. They returned to Lahiri Mahashai's Kutia in the late afternoon, but there was no opportunity to discuss these topics further for at that time everyone was immersed in Harinam Sankirtan. The following afternoon, everyone seated themselves in Paramahamsa Babaji's bower. 
Devi Vidyaratna and Shambhu sat next to Lahiri Mahashai. Just then, the Kazi from the village of Brahmana Pushkarini arrived. When the Vaishnavas saw him, they all stood up to offer him respect, and the Kazi also greeted the Vaishnavas with great pleasure and then sat in the assembly. Paramahamsa Babaji said, You are blessed, for you are a descendant of Chan Kazi, who was an object of the mercy of Sri Mahaprabhu. Please kindly bestow your mercy upon us. The Kazi said, By the mercy of Sri Mahaprabhu, we have become the objects of mercy of the Vaishnavas. Goranga is the lord of our life. We do not do anything without first offering our Dandavat pranam to him. Lahiri Mahashai was a learned scholar in the Farsi language, and he had studied the thirty safaras of the Quran and many books of the Sufis. He asked the Kazi, According to your ideology, what is meant by mukti? The Kazi replied, What you refer to as the jiva, individual soul, we called ru. This ru is found in two conditions, ru mujarad, the conscious or liberated soul, and ru tarkibi, the conditioned soul. What you refer to as spirit, chit, we call mujarad, and what you refer to as matter, achid, we call jism. Mujarad is beyond the limitations of time and space, whereas jism is subordinate to time and space. The conditioned soul, ru tarkibi, or bada jiva, has a material mind and is full of ignorance. The liberated souls, ru mujarad, are pure and aloof from all these contaminations, and they reside in the spiritual abode, which is known as Alam al-Mashal. The Ru becomes pure through the gradual development of Ishq, Prem. There is no influence of matter, Jism, in that abode where Koda, God, bought the prophet Paigamba Sahib. Yet even there, the Ru remains as a servitor, Banda, and the Lord is the master. Therefore the relationship between the Banda and Koda is eternal, and liberation, Mukti, is actually the attainment of this relationship in its pure form. The Quran and the literature of the Sufis explain these conclusions, but not everyone can understand them. Goranga Mahaprabhu mercifully taught Chan Kazi all these points, and since that time we have become his unalloyed bhaktas. Lahiri what is the primary teaching of the Qur'an? Kazi According to the Qur'an, the Lord's personal abode, which is the highest attainment in the spiritual world, is known as Behesht. It is a fact that there is no formal worship there, yet life itself is worship. The residents of that abode are immersed in transcendental bliss through seeing the Lord. This is the very same teaching that has been presented by Sri Gaurangadev. Lahiri, does the Quran accept that the Lord has a transcendental form? Kazi, the Quran states that the Lord has no form, but Sri Gaurangadev told Chan Kazi that this teaching of the Quran means that the Lord cannot have a material form. It does not preclude the existence of his pure spiritual form. Paigamba Sahib saw the divine loving form of the Lord in accordance with his level of eligibility. The transcendental moods and sentiments that are characteristics of the other rasas remain hidden from him. Lahiri, what is the opinion of the Sufis in this regard? Kazi, they adhere to the doctrine of Ana al-Haq, which means I am Koda. The Sufi doctrine of Islam is exactly the same as the Advaitavad doctrine. Lahiri, are you a Sufi? Kazi, no. We are unadulterated devotees. Goranga is our very life. The discussion went on for a long time, and finally Kazi Sahib offered his respects to the Vaishnavas and departed. Harinam Sankirtan followed, after which the assembly dispersed. Thus ends the fifth chapter of Jaivadharma, entitled, Vaidhi Bhakti is Eternal.